Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the State Library of New South Wales online programs and to this very special edition of Talking Deadly with Travis DeVries. I'm Damien Webb. My family and I are Palawa from the southeast of Lutrawitna, Tasmania, and I'm the manager of the Indigenous Engagement Branch. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the unceded land on which I'm today, the Gadigal Wangal people, as well as the traditional custodians of the lands from which our viewers join us. I offer my profound thanks and respect to elders past and present for their strength, wisdom, and humor. I would also like to acknowledge our young leaders and emerging elders whose voices and strength will shape future generations. Finally, I would like to extend my respect and solidarity to other First Nations and Indigenous peoples around the world, and in particular, any that are joining us tonight. Talking Deadly is an ongoing speaker series held at the library, uh, which tonight is online for the very first time, uh, and with a special guest host, Travis DeVries. Travis is a concept artist, podcaster, writer, and producer known for fusing Gamilaroi storytelling with modern tropes, characters, and themes. Travis' creative body of work ranges from Indigenous futurism to Gamilaroi noir. Each fortnight, Travis will be in conversation with a different First Nations artist whose work is responding to the legacy and 250th anniversary of Captain Cook's arrival in Kamei. The series coincides with the library's Eight Days in Kamei exhibition, which is online now, and Bumali Gallery's Not Young or Free exhibition, which is online and open currently as well. To start the series, Travis will be speaking tonight about his 2019 artwork, Tear It Down, a digital drawing acquired recently by the Australian Museum, which imagines Aboriginal activists pulling down the Captain Cook statue in Hyde Park. There will be time for a Q&A with Travis after the talk, so please share questions and comments in the chat. Are you there, Travis? Hello. I'll throw over to you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm just sharing my screen, everyone. Um, so please hold for one second. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Travis DeVries. Um, I am assuming that you can all see this now. Uh, so I'm a Gamilaroi Darug artist. Um, and uh, this is this is my work, uh, Tear It Down, from 2019, um, back in November. Um, it was originally called Cook Falling. Um, and then I had a conversation with my dad and um, changed the name to Tear It Down um, because Cook Falling kind of put um, Cook as the main character of, of, of the work. And um, I, I really wanted to work towards kind of changing, changing that part of the narrative. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about like um, the, the context and the storyline um, within this piece, uh, a little bit of um, uh, how I made it um, and the process. Um, and then uh, a bit of the imagery um, in the work, which you guys are seeing now. Um, a little bit about my inspirations, um, some new stuff and some of the other work that I made while um, uh, while I was making this. Um, and then obviously uh, we're in a pretty interesting time at the moment. Um, and there's some very interesting things going on uh, in the world, but also uh, quite locally with um, this particular statue in this particular place. And um, uh, so I would be sort of remiss to mention that and have a, um, a quick chat about that. Um, so yeah, I'm going to dive right in. Um, so obviously within the scene, you see um, a group of five or six activists pulling down um, with a rope tied around the neck of the statue of um, Cook uh, and, and with the uh, graffiti, which um, I, don't, I don't like to call vandalism um, because I don't believe it is. I believe it's political art or political protest statements. Um, and, and I really dislike the word vandalism when it's used on uh, in, in, in context with graffiti, but particularly in context with um, uh, political statement works, which I think are an Im important part of the uh, sort of protest and, and democratic sort of uh, conversation. Um, so I made this work on um, Procreate on the iPad, um, but went through a few 
uh, sort of iterations and tests and uh, work in process on um, just on with pencil and paper. Um, and uh, like the reason I made this work at the time was uh, I was working on uh, a graphic graphic novel. Um, I'm still I'm still working on it, and this was just uh, the second um, study for that work. Um, so I was looking really about studying and trying to figure out the sort of uh, what mediums I would use to make the graphic novel. I'm a traditionally a um, an oil painter um, and a drawer. Um, that's how I how I trained, um, and but I really wanted to work somewhat in digital and somewhat in um, those mediums for a for a graphic novel. But then, so this was an early um, sketch or study for for a um, digital drawing. Um, and I, for me, it was it was well, it's not a throwaway piece, but it was really like just working on it, working on a scene that I had in my um, head for that. Uh, for for the the larger story that I wanted to tell, um, but then I, I put it out on social media and um, and uh, friends and uh, supporters and my audience really engage with the obviously the imagery the powerful imagery in in this piece, and um, so this this sort of I almost wrote myself into a corner um, with the narrative and like since working on this piece, I, I didn't work on any of the narrative aspects further um, for, for a few months, basically because I, uh, I felt like I'd, or I've, I've written myself into a, a really hard place where this has to feature because audiences and um, friends and supporters are really, really, really excited by this work and I guess what it means. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to jump over. So this is just a quick making of, um, a 30 second video. Um, and you can see what it's going to show is like, um, the placing of various images on, on the screen and the iPad. And, um, I'm using reference material, which I do a lot in my work. Um, and, uh, one of the great things about using, um, software to make this work was that I could really, really stay true to the reference material by, by tracing. Um, and which is, you know, it's a great tool to have and can really create a really strong scene. Um, so I'll, I'll just play this and, and I will be quiet for 30 seconds. We're going to have some dead air. I'll play it again and I'll, I'll talk through it. So you can see like, as, as we're moving through, like um, I started off with these two different images um, across the page. Um, this one on the right is obviously a um, quite a, you know, globally well-known image. Um, and the one on the left is a fairly globally well-known image, although not necessarily uh, well-known of who it is, depending on where you are in the world. Um, whereas the one on the right is, I, th I think, majority of people um, in at least the Western world would know uh, where that image is from. Um, and you can see, like, I went through some various uh, changes of um, composition um, and, like, using different brushes and different um, techniques to kind of draw, uh, draw this work out. Um, so one of the things I wanted to talk about was this image, obviously, is um, quite... Yeah, it's quite a powerful um, work, uh, photograph, and that's also been turned into a commemorative statue. Um, and for me, this and and what my work is trying to do with this with this study is to kind of hold up a mirror to this sort of piece that's glorifying violence and glorifying war. Um, and glorifying uh, colonization and the colonial kind of constructs that we have in this society. Um, so like around the time of making this, um, I was actually listening to a lot of folk punk um, lyrics, uh, Pat the Bunny and um, 
Rams to Shackle Glory. Um, and they a lot of, uh, I guess, protest songs um, and uh, anarchist lyrics. And I, I was really inspired by kind of the imagery within, within those um, songs and those lyrics. And I was like, okay, well, so what, what do I want to make um, with, with this piece and with this um, graphic novel and the story that I'm trying to tell? And so for Tear It Down, um, I, I looked at this idea of this uh, colonial symbol of, uh, of, of Captain Cook um, that, and, and within, within the week leading up to making this work, I, I think I went for a meeting at the Australian Museum. Um, I was in residence there for, for quite a while um, in 2018 and I was going to a follow-up meeting with the curators there and uh, I obviously, went, as soon as you're in the city in High Park, I mean, walking to the Australian Museum from uh, Museum Station, you walk past the Cook statue and it is huge. And it is, as an, uh, as an Aboriginal person, as a Gamilaroi person, I find walking past there incredibly oppressive. Um, it's in your face symbolism of uh, colonial takeover. Um, and, and it's a symbol that's like staying in, in the zeitgeist and staying in, in the world. Um, and I think like, uh, in 2016, uh, and, and, and around this time, um, I was really, I was really quite inspired by what was going on in America with the tearing down of, um, the, uh, the, the, the slave, um, the, the slaver statues and the um, the leaders of the one the South um, from from back in the uh, the like the the war there um, and the like the kind of conversations around that of like we're not tearing down history we're tearing down this why are we celebrating this history um, and America has a very different timeline in terms of that sort of stuff to Australia um, and you know, neither country is without its flaws in this, in this space. Um, so what I wanted to do with using the, uh, the Iojima, um, image and the planning of the flag was to, to mirror that, to go, this is this, um, you know, celebrated act of, of war. And, um, you know, I know that World War Two was, um, and, and the landing at Iojima and the, the battle was, had a different context to tearing down statues, but um, you know this is this is one of the most sort of iconic images of of a uh, a victory um, in my mind. Um, and so I was like, okay, how do I turn that on its head? So I uh, so I took took that and um, I was like, okay, they're planning a flag. All right, so these are these are the people that are going to be tearing down this this other symbol and the flag is obviously a symbol of um colonial structures um so i'm going to talk a bit now about just some other um pop, pop culture context um i teased that slide just a minute ago um this is very recognizable as well this is obviously a um image of uh from the simpsons um and you can see the white house uh in the background there as a, it's a press conference. Um, and this is, uh, a image from a 1995 episode of the Simpsons, I believe, um, or maybe a little bit later, uh, where they, uh, predicted that president Trump would happen and Lisa would follow off, fix the things that president Trump screwed up. Um, I, I bring this up because obviously I, I made this work back in, um, 2019, um, and my, and as my response to sort of how I was feeling at the time, um, and, uh, still feel now, um, to create this sort of like vision of what I wanted to see in the world. And then obviously now we're going through this sort of, uh, very tumultuous sort of, uh, and powerful uprising in the world where we're saying, you know, like enough is enough and a, a number of different, uh, cultural, groups are saying that and we're, that we're done with uh, this colonial uh, 
capitalist world and the power structures that are controlling it and we are going to tear it down and we're going to kind of work as a society to fix the wrongs that we see in the world um and so like seeing seeing i guess uh the the simpsons effect um of like uh, pop culture kind of uh art a life becoming art um and predicting the future I, I was like oh i need to i need to mention this um i'm gonna i'm gonna jump on over so this is some of the other um studies that i was doing at the time um and i'm going to talk a bit more about the sort of context within the work and how this um the storyline that i was working on so this is uh, I'm emailing this to myself right now at this talk. So it's, um, it's all completely, the storyline is completely co uh, copyright protected and you guys can't take the idea and, and run with it. Um, so uh, it's, it's following this group of um, Aboriginal activists um, who are um, working to overthrow the Australian uh, government and, colonial structure that exists um, and what they do to protect their uh, identities is use these kangaroo masks. So in the uh, original Tear It Down work, you see them you know, carrying, a, holding a kangaroo mask. Um, and uh, one of the things uh, about tearing down a statue is that it takes more than five or six people. Um, you, you would hope, um, otherwise I'm, I'm surprised that it hasn't been teared down already. Uh, so this, the, uh, there's some superpowers within, in the story. Um, I'm not going to tell you the sort of origin story of the superhero within it. Um, but he, uh, they use their powers to kind of overthrow this, help this, help the goals and ideologies of the, uh, the militant group. Um, and so I have this, like, there's a few other key images that I'm working on. It's, um, like, a group of activists uh, standing in front of um, an orator, and the orator is um, from one from the government um, and a non-Indigenous person, and they're, you know, kind of talking a whole lot of crap that, you know, doesn't really look like politicians seem to do at the moment. Um, and one by one, the uh, audience brings up their kangaroo masks and, and kind of turn, turn the tides and the politician uh, moves off and leaves. Um, and then this is the, uh, this is the kind of superhero character in the work. Um, and the group is called the Warriors of New Dreaming, um, which is, yeah, just a, a fun little name that I came up with, but uh, you'll see like further in the work when, if, if you keep engaging with it um, uh, further that it, like this kind of ties in with a whole bunch of other sort of society things that are going on. Uh, so obviously this is a more recent um, image, quite a recent image uh, because people seem to be concerned that <laughs> Uh, see, people seem to be concerned about the safety of this statue, um, and you know, there's. I think I, I think I read there was 350 uh, police officers in Hyde Park uh, protecting the statue, and it, it seems like a lot of money, um, and also a lot of money to spend on. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be anyone else around, um, and. You know, I, I imagine there was other crimes going on that, you know, could have used some policemen um, if that's what they're uh, supposed to be doing. Um, not to, you know, bring in too much of my politics within to um, this this talk. Um, I'm just going to jump over here. This is um, sort of the last uh, big slide. Um, this is... Well, the reason I added these slides in is because I, I can't not talk about this work at the moment with um, without talking about what's going on. Um, and like I made this work back in November and I obviously didn't know and couldn't know that uh, the current events that we're seeing was going to happen. Um, 
and I, and we planned this talk um, two months ago to chat about this work, um, which was uh, collected by the Australian Museum more recently for for their exhibition that's going to be uh, responding to the Cook um, 2020 uh, celebrations by the Australian government. And our Prime Minister spent a whole lot of money on um, celebrating this uh, moment in history when um, this man apparently discovered Australia, which, you know, is one, one of the things I'm doing within this work and, and the idea of tearing down a statue is that the, the history seems to always be written by the victor, but we're, I mean, we're still here. Um, and there was no, you know, apparently there was no um, battles um, and no uh, conquest and it was you know it was a peaceful conquest um, there were skirmishes but no war um, and there was no treaty signed um, so you know we're not one we're not beating beaten um, two we weren't we didn't sign a treaty so there's we're not at peace um, so in my mind the war is still going on and so history uh, still has this opportunity to be written by the victor and it's still unsure of who the victor is in this situation. Um, but the reason I talk about this is that we can, we can choose as a country and as a, you know, current culture um, that is a mix of the, a, a diverse group of cultures now, like in Australia, we are, we are not white. Um, and, and I am, you know, I am the product of multiple cultural groups. Um, but we, we're at a point where we can choose to um, write the history that we want to write. And um, like, f for me, I, I want to write the history where we don't have this oppressive statue celebrating this person who was, by all accounts, by all his own accounts and of other people's, um, quite a horrible person. Uh, so this, what I was doing with this work um, and what I was long windedly trying to say is that I was painting the future that I wanted to see in the world. Um, I want to see more of this um, uh, uprising of good people um, making a stand and changing the world to the way that they want to see it and changing it for the good of um, as many people as we can. Um, and, and like, so this, like for me, this is so much more of a powerful image than this. Um, and you know, this is this uh, character on the right, uh, on the left, sorry. Um, this is, this is the superhero uh, for our time. Um, and, and the, the person who will be the main character in, in the story. Um, yeah, thank you. Th thank you so much, everybody for, for listening. Um, we're going to uh, imagine we've got some questions and some stuff that um, we might delve a little bit deeper into. Um, now, now that I've kind of gone through that talk, you, I'm going to leave this slide up for a moment. Um, and, uh, um, if you want to keep following on with my work, you can, um, jump on Instagram and follow me there. It's Travis H DeVries, um, or jump onto my website at travisdevries.com and, um, join my mailing list. Um, we have, uh, some prints of this work available, um, uh, at the moment and you can find them on the site there. Um, brilliant. I am going to stop sharing. Uh, Damien, I, you're coming back. I am coming back. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, yeah. I mean, it's really quite incredible. As you mentioned, this, this talk has been planned for months. The artwork has <clears throat> been around since last year. It's responding to, I believe the, um, the messaging that was added to the statue was 2016 or 2017. Yeah. And I, I found that that was like a really powerful piece of work that that person did. And, um, and, and, and like, 
I thought it was amazing. It was around, it was around um, Invasion Day um, of 2016 that that happened. Yeah, um, so it's got quite a long bow, this, this artwork, and it's, this, but it's happening in this moment. Is, um, yeah, it must be very strange for you. Is, it, is this a work that you are particularly fond of out of all your work, or is it just something that's, that's really been captured by this conversation and discussion? Um, I think it's something that's been captured really recently um, by the conversation. But of, like when I first put it out, I received like just incredible feedback. But for me, it's not, it was, it is really just a, a study in a larger body of work um, about this storyline. Um, and, and I've had like a few kind of conversations with people um, over the last week about it. Um, obviously with this talk coming up and um uh, with everything going on, it's like, oh, you should do the, this, you know, sort of, you should do a, a series of um, these images. I'm like, no, no. I yeah, like, need to do back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, like, I mean, that just seems to kind of be taking advantage of the situation. Whereas like, this is, this is not really what this was about. Um, this was kind of, it, like I said, it was like about painting a scene of what I wanted to see happen. Um, uh, yes, like, so are you a witch? I mean, <laughs> the obvious question. Uh, hey, I, I, you know, magician never reveals their secrets. Um, I don't think so. I mean, I was actually like a lot of my kind of work around the time and still now um, has quite a lot to do with like self actualization. Um, and so I have a series of like self portraits um, painting myself as the uh, Gamilaroi god by army. Um, yeah, I have a little bit of an ego, uh, and I, li I, I like to embody that. Um, and so like w within the same sort of style of work and, and within the same vein of like you, you do the David Bowie of you, you know, you kind of paint the person, you make the art of being the person you want to be. Um, yeah. definitely. And I mean, as you would have seen and experienced this, plenty of other ways that you'll be minimized as an Aboriginal artist anyway. So you might as well be the biggest version of yourself that you can. Yeah, I certainly try. Um, I think we have some questions in the, uh, yeah. Did you want to dive into those? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, do you want to, do you want to read them out and then I'll. Sure. Yeah. Um, Travis, if your work predicts the future, can I commission you to make a few more prints and statues being taken down? I have a couple in mind uh yeah that's that yeah why not um i sure right i guess although like i mean if i'm predicting the future but you're commissioning me to <laughs> make a work i feel like that might be a closed loop and might like that might be taking advantage of the magic um and i mean this this the this uh scene that is being depicted this um event um hasn't actually happened yet but um, the, some people are scared of, of it happening. Um, so let's, I mean, let's, let's wait and see. Yeah. Um, what should happen with the statues of the colonizers, mainly male, always put out in public in CBDs? Should they be removed and put in museums so that they can remain as provocations, as a way to change the narrative in ways that don't mimic the exact strategy of colonization, namely erasure? What should happen to that Cook statue? Um, it's that's a great question and thank you so much um i I don't, I don't actually know what should happen um i totally believe that they should be um removed um and i i think that that removing should be done by the government um that they should read the room um so that we like people like myself and other activists um don't have to put themselves in harm's way to take them down. Mm. Um, I think that I don't think they should be in put in museums um, so that they remain as provocations. I I personally feel like um, we already have museums are changing and growing all the time, and I think like that we as a society can like make those choices and. Um, talk about what needs to be displayed and that's why we have curators and I don't think 
any current curator <laughs> would put this in their museum. Um, and, and some, you know, sections of society may be quite up in arms about that. But I, yeah, uh, I think I've, I've seen Nathan sentence, um, my colleague who's written a question um, that don't we have enough colonizers in museums? Yes, we do. Um, and we have them out on the street being, um, you know, lording over us. Uh, I think it's like you, you don't need to have a statue of this anymore. Like um, I think as a society, we've moved on from this like deification of this like, you know, it's a lie. It's a deification based on a lie. Um, this idea that this man was so amazing and sailed ar around the world and discovered all of these vast lands. It's, it's telling the story from a English um, point of view where there was this, you know, idea that they had to sail around the world and they romanticize this idea of going and discovering untouched lands and here be, here be monsters and mm -hmm. all of that stuff. And it's like, well, there was people here already and a flourishing society. Mm -hmm. um, and what you did was uh, come in here and, and steal and take and uh, set up your own constructs on top of a, something that was already here. Um, so the, the statue is based on a lie. Um, and it's a lie that you could, you know, it's a nice bedtime story that you continue to tell yourself to make you feel okay. Mm. <clears throat> and there is something very, I, I don't know if it's it's a, a very Western thing, but that idea of, you know, to, to recreate history, you literally just create a lifelike figure of that human. It's a very uncreative way of marking out very aggressively this history. And it, it seems that, you know, that, some of that Western memory, they can rely on institutions and statues to carry their history and they don't need to think about it the way that a lot of us do as Aboriginal people. We have to carry that, that history every day. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, like, there's a lot of argument from people around keeping them that we should, oh, we need to learn from our mistakes. Um, no one who says that can tell me how this statue being here is an admittance of a mistake um, or an admittance of wrongdoing. Um, yeah, it's, it is a glorification of a bastardly act. Yeah. Excellent. A um, couple of other questions coming through. Do you see your art as activism? It might be hard to separate the two concepts in the current climate, but is that how you identify your art as activism? Uh, so no, I don't, I don't at all. Um, so one of the things I do with my work is I try not to be overtly political. Obviously this work has screwed that up completely. Um, for me, like I am very much about telling a story um, within each piece and telling a bigger story. So this, like, for me, this is just one scene in a larger, um, a larger narrative. Um, and there's, you know, thoughts and feelings from the characters in the work. Um, and um, there's, you know, this whole greater timeline. And, and none of my other works are overtly political. And, and this one, I guess, like, the politics that I bring in through my works are told throughout the various characters. A lot of, a lot of my works kind of explore these, like, multiple uh, storylines and subplots um, and sort of vast uh, epic epic kind of um, stories. Uh, and so I, I, I tend to uh, put my activism hat on when I'm being an activist and when I'm making art um, and telling uh, stories and, and writing, I put myself in different characters shoes and be an activist from their point of view. So if the person in the story wants to be an activist, then this happens. Um, but yeah, I, I guess like I, I'm telling the story that I want to see happen in a way. Um, but I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't describe it as art as activism. Um, mm. Although I think like it'd be a amazing flag to carry yeah. um, of a, you know, a, a hope and dream of what activism can achieve. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that, I mean, it harks back to that very, famous quote that you know to be born aboriginal is to be born political you 
sometimes don't have a choice in whether you're viewed as an activist or whether you're, as you mentioned, just working through your own actualization and dealing with these issues as an artist and a person you often will get invoked to, you know? Yeah, do. absolutely. And, and I think you see so much um, Aboriginal art that has to either be activist and political based or Aboriginal art that has to be traditional based. And you don't really see this sort of like in between there where it's just telling contemporary modern stories from an Aboriginal perspective. And it, like one of the things that I love to do in my work is uh, just tell stories about pop culture and like fun things. I, I do a podcast with my brother called Bur Originals where we just sort of riff on, on stuff and, um, you know, two guys with a podcast who would have thought. Um, but like nothing in there the majority of stuff in there is like not at all political or activist based um, because, but even that with in itself is sort of out my own way of like rebelling against this idea of what society wants me to be, which is either a traditional Aboriginal out there in a remote community or a inner city black who is angry and uh, fired up. Yeah, definitely. There's a, Another question from Alistair Hill um, saying, um, when you were initially conceptualizing the graphic novel, did you have a specific time in the future that it was set? Um, that's a really good question. I've actually, like uh, I said that um, after this work, I didn't, I didn't write anything about oh, for the novel um, for four or five months. Um, I've only just started writing it again properly now. Um, I was originally thinking um, that it would be an alternate timeline um, and set back in 2016 mm -hmm. um, that this event took place um, and that the graffiti art on the uh, plinth for the statue led to this sort of uh, kind of boiling point where the statue was torn down. Um, and that's something that I would have, you know, definitely supported. Um, but then I kind of played with it being set in 2023 um and then said in 2020 um but now it uh yeah it is it is set in the future um mm. is is what i'll say yeah you don't want to be proven wrong by putting an exact date on it <laughs> proven right and <laughs> i don't know which would be worse. date i'll put a date and time stamp in the next one and we'll see how we go yeah and that that sense of time i, I think is is really a big part of why so many people are really confronted by the image. I mean, even on the, the State Library's social media, when we shared um, shared this uh, on Facebook, it attracted a, a certain amount of um, the kind of conversation you can expect and uh, very strong resistance to this idea. But the same event was shared via Twitter, which is normally much more vitriolic, but with the, the image of your lovely face instead of the artwork, and it didn't attract. So it, there seems to be this real just knee-jerk reaction to that imagery that um, is, is really quite interesting as much as it is upsetting. Yeah, well, I think it's, uh, and, uh, yeah, I think that's Im it's important to note, like, that it is um, not going to be easy for those people who have been in power um, and and who are kind of benefiting from the construct that this symbol represents um it's not going to be easy for them to see it torn down um or to you know change the everyone says change is never easy but like i want to see change and i want to see change for the better mm -hmm. um and i think that symbols of impressive of oppressive structures um getting removed um is is going to be a be a symbolic a huge change um and but i th yeah I, th I can understand why people seeing this sort of stuff um on on social media but also seeing that you know this is the sort of image that our major cultural institutions are now collecting um <laughs> if i can see why that that would be upsetting for some people um but for me it's such a positive thing um uh because. Yeah, related to that. I mean, is it super weird for you to have this this artwork that is speaking to 
resistance and decolonization is now part of the collection of the Australian Museum. And obviously you're, you're speaking here at the, the State Library, another sandstone colonial institution. Is that weird? How do you kind of view that? Um, yeah, no, it, abs it absolutely is weird and it has been quite bizarre. Um, I, I, f I found like that I've been involved with the Australian Museum for quite some time and they've supported like a lot of my work. And I think, um, I think these cultural institutions, while they are still run from by a majority of non-Indigenous and non-diverse people, I think like they are open to being part of that change. Um, and I think that that takes time to filter through and, um, and and but it like it is totally bizarre that this is being collected by by that organization um like this is the piece that they they wanted they have have so much more um politically socially palatable pieces that they could have been after but the um the first nations team um uh, that work at the museum and um Laura McBride and um Dr Marinko Smith and Nathan Sentence like they they are representing um, First Nations people from kind of across Australia and they, they were so involved in community. Um, and that that's, you know, that is the mandate that they push is to um, represent the wishes of that group within society. And so for me, like it, it makes sense that this work um, is, is beca has become part of that collection. Um, and like, really it's kind of, mm -hmm. for me, it's, it's a huge honor to, uh, be collected there and be kept in sandstone, so to speak. Like, it's, there's some longevity there. Yeah, alongside artifacts of of Cook and and some of these figures, it's I think um, definitely what you mentioned that it, the the change is, is is happening and it's slow, and you become very aware of where that line is and how much appetite there is for change in situations like this. These, these invisible lines become very, very clear. Um, and I suppose it's really important that we do this work when it's uncomfortable, not just when it's reconciliation week or when there's a nice afternoon tea. I mean, I suppose, um, I think we've still got time for another little question or if there are any other kind of thoughts or anything else you wanted to, to mention. Yeah, actually, like, um, I was talking to my friend about this work the other day and, and they asked, like, what was what was in this place before the statue? Mm. Um, and, and, like, I, co I couldn't answer. And I, I know we talked about this um, yesterday when we were having a chat on the phone about the, the conversation. Um, and, you know, it was... One, one of the things I wanted to mention tonight was about how, like... Uh, often in towns across Australia and cities is that these um, colonial structures and kind of great monuments to the great white man have been built on top of um, sacred Aboriginal sites and like sites of power. Um, so you see towns like Bathurst where their, um, their town bell is built on top of a, um, a, a bora ground where initiation rites would happen. Um, and so like this idea of kind of pulling down societal structures that were there before and replacing them with the society that is represented now is not a, um, it's not a new idea. <laughs> and, and if you, you know, if, um, non-Indigenous people say that they want, reconciliation and reconciliation is a government um, mandate and a government policy and a government word and a white word um, then this is I think this is fucking part of it um, and they need and yeah they need to get on board or go back to where they came from <laughs> I mean it's I believe that the Burke statue that's actually outside the library um, <clears throat> who has his own um, specific crimes to, to yet be kind of accounted for but his statue was originally supposed to be in the spot that, that Cook is in now and they were concerned that the, the park was too bare and didn't give him enough kind of 
grandiose stature, that the, the intent was literally to make this an awe-inspiring <clears throat> symbol. And hilariously enough, they flattened and, and destroyed all of the ground and made it too barren to put that statue there. So the Cook statue ended up going there a little bit later, I think about 30 years later. And yeah, it's quite interesting, as you mentioned, we've moved statues around in this city, covered things up, changed things for all sorts of reasons. I think Burke got moved for Shakespeare. You know, there's, there's a history, a long history of Europeans putting fig leaves over genitalia. Like we've censored things because our values change before. Um, do you see this as uh, censoring is definitely the wrong word, but we do modify what we think is an acceptable public commemoration. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think these, you know, monuments, I think monuments and um, should reflect society at the time. And I, I don't think we're, I don't think we're ever beholden to what past people have put there or even what um, people still living have put there. Like we can, as a society, we're, we're all supposed to be adults and we can have these conversations and um, make these decisions as a group. Um, and I mean, the, the mood of society at the moment, um, seems to be that they, you know, they want this vision of the world to happen as well, where we're not celebrating colonizers and genociders and murderers. Um, but we're, you know, we're, we're rebuilding this, um, you know, not, not to say that everything's, uh, flowers and peace and happiness, but where that's what we should be striving for is a world where war doesn't exist anymore. Mm. Um, and that we don't, but we don't need police because we have, we have communities where police don't have to be called. Um, and you know, if, if we are calling police, they, you know, they show up with a helpful hand and, and not reaching for tasers and guns and handcuffs. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'm, sorry. Sorry. No, I, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I've been quite fired up in the last few weeks and, um, please, quite, uh, I guess feeling, uh, fairly sort of all over the place with everything going on. And, um, yeah, I, I, I'm bringing into, I'm bringing in some of my politics into the conversation. Please do. You're, you're a guest of the library. We're here to hear your views as an artist. And if, the, you know, I, I don't think you can you can cleanly separate politics from from being alive and practicing art as an Aboriginal person at the moment. Um, I think that's something other people will continue to dissect and do to you. But um, yeah, I suppose I think we're running a little over time. I'm having a great time. We can stay all night. But there is just uh, one question just scrolled past. Um, someone's asking. You mentioned walking past the Cook statue is oppressive. They're wondering what other things that they might be walking past every day that they don't even notice has a similar kind of impact. Are there any other standouts in, in Sydney, whether it's a, a statue or, or anything else? Uh, I mean, yeah, look, look up, I would say. Um, I, 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 for one, am uh, kind of not a great fan of tall cement buildings um, uh, but like the it, like it, we, we mentioned sandstone before um, and these cultural institutes that are built out of sand and um, I so a bit of context I used to work at the Opera House um, as a First Nations producer and um, I used to do a lot of the acknowledgements to countries and welcomes to country when I was down there and I when I think when someone does a, a welcome or acknowledgement, I, th I don't think you just do um, the acknowledgement or the welcome. You tell a story or you present a piece of art or a performance or dance mm -hmm. or something cultural. Cause I don't think those things are just a, you know, tick of the box sort of thing. Um, so I would tell this story cause that's another part of what I do is um, do live storytelling and, and podcasting stuff. Um, I tell a story about uh, the the middens that were there, um, and that the, it was a sacred site and a, a huge cultural site um, where middens were collected, and and the people would kind of 
use this site as a ceremony ground. Um, and, but even, even just a midden on its own, which is, if, if you don't know, like a, a, a mound of she- seashells, um, and they come in different layers uh, as, as they fish the seasonal the shells. And so they would see what's there and you'd go to, uh, you'd get the next one rather than overfishing um, the thing before. Uh, that got used in the foundations of government house. Um, so when they were excavating the opera house um, underneath recently in the last few years, um, they actually found the lime burner ovens. Um, and before it was called Bennelong Point, it was called Lime Burners Point because they burnt down these sacred sites to build the foundations of these sandstone buildings that are around. So, mm-hmm. like, I mean, for me, it, it, walking around Sydney, walking around Melbourne, um, the whole place has this sort of oppressiveness built into the foundations of it because it's been built on the sacred sites and the bodies of like our our people that were here. Um, And there's nothing like, there's nothing that can happen to change that. Yeah. But like, I think these overt statues that are here, that that's something we can change. Mm, definitely. I mean, I know where there's a growing awareness um, in the, obviously one half of the, the library building is, um, is you know, incredible looming sandstone colonial construct and actually doing some research recently and, and looking at the fact that it is built out of Marubra sandstone, that the, um, uh, what they used to set the stones together was, was ground down middens that, these institutions are, as you said, these are literally built out of country. The, the stories and people and voices within that stone and within those middens are actually, have been repurposed into these um, incredible edifices. I, I had a positive ending to that story when, yeah, I, when I usually tell it, um, is that like, because we're still a part of those foundations and the country is still a part of the foundations, um, whenever we do anything in there, we can kind of continuing those traditions of ceremony. Um, and, you know, that those places continue to be places of power. Mm-hmm. And um, when we do performances and ceremony there again, we, we're sending that power out into the, out into the world. Mm-hmm. Um, which is a little bit wishy-washy, I know. No, it's like, beautiful. hey, <laughs> I ruined it. No, it's beautiful. It's a lovely note to end on because I think we're out of time. But um, I would like to thank you very much again. And for everybody tuning in from home, uh, the next event will be in a fortnight's time and I will be out of the picture and Trav will be talking with um, one of the artists from Bumali um, and their exhibition that's on at the moment, Not Young or Free. So thank you very much, Travis. No, thank you for having me, and um, I'm, and thank you to the State Library um, uh, for bringing me on for this. Um, it's really great, uh, and I can't wait to see everyone uh, in two weeks. Fantastic. Thanks.